Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady. And for this week's guest, we have my good friend, Brian McVickers. Brian and I have known each other coming on 20 years now, and we've been working together for over 15 years. Brian is the Overland International Chief Business Development Officer, but he is also an extremely well-traveled individual. Brian has cast off the bow lines and he's sailed for years with his wife, Amy. Brian and I crossed the Pacific together on the Kailani Expedition. Brian's been along with me during Expedition 7 on our trip also up to Tuktiuktuk with AEV, crossing the Altar Desert, a bunch of different adventures. Brian has a really interesting life story, and one of the things that's most encouraging about his story is how his relationship with his wife has been such a cornerstone of his adventures. Amy is an incredible adventure traveler in her own right, and it has been such a joy for me to see them travel together so successfully, including when they first met and decided to buy a sailboat, uh, kind of sight unseen, move down to Florida, uh, live on the boat in a marina for two years. But they also talk about why there was a certain point in time that they know they needed to stop trying to prepare the boat and cast off those bow lines and leave the marina for the Caribbean islands and for the Atlantic Ocean. So enjoy my wide-ranging conversation with Brian McVickers about overlanding, sailing, and about a life filled with casting off those bow lines. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. Well, Brian, man, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. We have known each other a very long time, and, and you're not only a dear friend, you're a business partner, and you're so well-traveled in your own right, and you've got so many interesting stories to share with the audience today. So, man, it's just such a joy to have you on the podcast. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Scott. It was uh, neat to get the call to be on the podcast, and then, you know, once to get here, once I got here to find out you guys just wanted to talk about me was kind of strange, but <laughs> I guess I'll roll with it. Yeah, it's... it's answer the questions It's very, want. It's very difficult. I resisted <laughs> having myself on the podcast for as long as I possibly could until uh, Matt and Ashley finally said I didn't have a choice any longer. Sure. So, so, but uh, you've been on the podcast before as a subject matter expert. We've talked about vehicles. We've talked about our trip across the Pacific Ocean uh, in a sailboat together that we did several years ago with a group of friends. Yeah, just two years ago. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. The Ka Kailani Expedition. A uh, big thanks to Rusty for making that happen for us. Still, there's more to come. Yeah, too. that's right. Exactly. Can't wait for where that, where that leads. But you have not only a long history in travel, including remote sailing uh, with your wife, Amy, uh, but also you have been involved with the overland industry in the United States since its beginnings. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those things. But let's start off with where where did Brian McVickers begin in the world? I mean, you don't have to go back too far. but like. Not too far. There, you know, so when I was growing up, there was a picture of a, a, a surplus army tent on the wall in my house. And I was like, why do we have this picture of this tent? And I, one day I asked my mom, I was like, what's up with this tent? What is it? And they were like, oh, well, that's where you came from. And I was like, that's all I wanted to know. We can take that picture down now. <laughs> uh, so now we know where Brian came from. Right. Brian came from a surplus started, canvas started army tent. started out camping. <laughs> you did, exactly. <laughs> from the very beginning. Uh, well, and, and camping and the outdoors have been a big part of your life. Uh, so, so you grew up in the Chicago area, I did. and let's talk a bit a bit about 
the outdoor experiences that you had because you it's been a lifetime passion of yours it has you know i i think so i grew up in chicago uh in the suburbs of chicago in in a place called lagrange um it's like you know about 30 minutes outside of the city from the lakefront and you know as a kid i was i was a boy scout for a while um always enjoyed the outdoors i was, also did a lot of team sports um and then i think towards high school i started to get a little bit more involved in travel. Um, I was very, in hindsight, I was ex- extremely fortunate that my my stepfather was um, an, a United Airlines pilot. Oh, wow. That <clears throat> and, I didn't know. And so he was a United Airlines pilot for a long time. And when I was in high school, we had this book of tickets that was basically like a checkbook with a carbon copy in it. And so we could go to the airport and look and see what flights were open and we could write our own ticket to go wherever we wanted to as long as there was a flight and a seat and a seat wow right and um and so we'd go travel on the weekends we'd go you know sometimes we'd go on a little bit more exotic trips i remember one weekend we just flew to paris for a three-day trip to go to the paris boat show and then turned around and came home um and so that was a lot of stuff that I think, you know, now as a, as a parent and an adult, I'm like, wow, how do you, how do you do that without that little magic book of tickets? Yeah. Right. Um, it's a lot harder it, for sure. It is. So we got <laughs> to, we got to do a lot of neat little trips like that. Um, and so I feel fortunate. And I think that the best part about that is it opened my eyes to not just travel, but international travel. Sure. Um, and then along that along that same period, when I was in high school, I was racing sailboats a lot, and that required a lot of travel as well because mm. we, we raced at a very competitive level, which made you travel around the country, and you got to see a lot more than just your, your hometown. So, well, and, and I remember, I mean, and it's interesting how sailing has remained woven throughout your life, but... One of the things that I do remember was that you felt like you learned a lot about working with a team. You learned a lot about how to prepare, in this case, a sailboat or a vehicle. But talk a little bit about what were some of those core lessons that you brought away um, as as a young man, as a, a teammate, and as the beginnings of, of, of being a part of travel uh, from that sailing experience? Yeah, I think the the biggest takeaway I think that relates to travel and adventure is to have flexibility. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes in, into it and there's a lot of skill development, but at the end of the day, if you're not flexible with the conditions that you're presented with, then you're not going to succeed. Ah, interesting. Uh, and I find that and know, sailing is so dynamic. It, it's, it's constantly a changing environment. Um, you can be, as well prepared and well trained and skilled as you want to be, and at the end of the day, it's not necessarily your call and the mm-hmm. outcome. Yeah, so, sure. You know, the weather <clears throat> plays such a big part of it. Um, you know, there's just com- you know, mechanical failures and fatigue, mm-hmm. and, and if, if everything's right, you, you can have great. You can have a lot of great success. You can have amazing adventures. You can have really significant, you know, wins. Yeah, sure. Um, but you take that into travel and, you know, think about all the travel you've done and some of the travel that we've done together is, you know, you can do everything to the point that you find it to be the right way to do it. Mm. And at the end of the day, you know, you might not get allowed to cross that border crossing Yeah, sure. You know, for whatever reason you might, you know, have a mechanical with a vehicle and there's so many variables that I think flexibility really plays a lot into it. No, it, it, it absolutely does. And then you, you built on top of that foundation of a lot of skill. And, you know, one of the stories that, you know, I, I wanted to share on the podcast was it was not that long ago that, that uh, Amy and you came to the lake and we were, we were sailing my little sailboat and, um, and it's a Catalina 250 for those that are interested. But that's, you know, you can sleep on it and it's got a little galley Great and a little, ba- little bathroom and everything. But, the fastest that I had ever gotten that boat was 5.7 knots. And that's me taking everything that I had learned crossing the Pacific and listen to you and, and listen to, to Rusty and listen to Kevin and these guys, these incredibly experienced sailors. And I'm trying, and I, everything that I could do to get that boat to 5.7 knots. And you came out and I remember just how nuanced 
your inputs were to the sail and also like the position of the boat into the wind. And the next thing I know, uh, I think we hit 6.2 knots as I remember, or at least we six point up in the sixes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and what was really interesting to me is like, well, theoretically, I mean, the theoretical whole speed of that boat is a little bit less than that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the only thing I could figure is because it has a wing keel, there's got to be some factors that allowed that boat to actually sail that fast. Sure. Or, or maybe it was just for a moment in time before the the hydraulics and physics start to take over Everything again. Everything catches but up with itself. That's right. Yeah. But it was it was just really fun for me to see and that reminder of that it is so important to work on the fundamentals of these activities. Be skilled in the operation of a winch. Uh, be skilled in communicating with your partner on spotting and all of that other stuff. Because when when I was watching Amy and you sail my boat, you guys hadn't been on a sailboat together in a really long time. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. So, and it certainly had been not been a long time since you were trying to optimize a boat for speed for fun. Yeah, it's second nature to us. Though. And it was. Yeah. You guys, it was the, all of that muscle memory. <clears throat> yeah, that was very cool. And I can see how the the opportunity of working with a team in sailing would be so dynamic and challenging. And probably you're learning how to communicate in really frustrating environments. Yeah, I, I would say so. And I think a big part of that is trust. Yeah. You, you know, it, even some of these larger expeditions that we've done, whether it's vehicle-based or, or sailboat-based, mm-hmm. You know, you and I have both been a part of that process of vetting the team. Yeah. Right. So who's going to come along? What are their strengths? What are the weaknesses? You know, are the strengths, you know, a viable option for the, for, for the trip that we're going to go do? Sure. And then are the weaknesses, are, are they too weak? Are those, are they, yeah. you know, are they kind of, that they're going to get opted out because of the weaknesses or can you manage it? <clears throat> and that's where you kind of find this really great team. Yeah. Right. And not being afraid to put in boundaries with place with people in place with people that you, maybe you wanted to have come along, but they're not going to work out. Yeah. You're you way better off expectations. You're way better off just saying, you know what? It's not a good fit for you to come on the trip. Yeah. I mean, and, and that sometimes that's like a family member or sometimes that's a longtime friend that just hasn't proven to be reliable or a positive member of the of the experience. Yeah. So, but I think that that trust factor in whether you're doing a, an expedition or a large trip by, by boat or by vehicle, if you trust the team and each member yeah. within their strengths and weaknesses, that makes all the difference. Yeah. You know, I, I remember, you know, when Amy and I first got married 2000 and you know, the first thing we did is just sell everything. We bought a sailboat. We lived on it for a couple of years. And then we kind of disappeared and traveled on it for two years. And yeah. we had set that boat up to be single handable by each of us. Yeah. So one person's sleeping and the other person's sailing. And this could be, you know, usually for big overnights mm-hmm. and multi, multi-day where you've got multiple overnights. But, you know, to wake up at 2.30 in the morning on your ear, right? So you're, yeah. the boat's heeled over and you're in a storm and you wake up and you're completely calm about it because you trust yeah. that the other person is completely competent mm-hmm. and trustworthy and, and you, you have no question about what's going on. Yeah. And then to be able to fall back asleep, that says a lot about the people that you're traveling with. So we started out our marriage that way, um, which I think carries over to today. Um, oh, I see it. And, yeah. and, you know, I think a carryover to the overlanding thing is if you're traveling with someone and you cannot feel comfortable closing your eyes while they're driving, sure. it's probably a good idea to adjust, either adjust expectations or they need some additional training or you need a different travel partner. Yeah. Because it's so interesting how people drive to their own desires, not to the fact that they have a car filled with people or at least one other person. Sure. So um, when we're driving overland vehicles, particularly internationally or during longer trips, expeditions, I mean, I think about when I was crossing Antarctica, you know, like if I didn't get sleep, I wouldn't be able to drive for that next 12, 14 hour stint. Right. Um, And so the, how mindful that person was, was really critical. I mean, could I, can you sleep? in the passenger seat with a person that's driving 
maybe ask yourself that question. So yeah, well, I remember when we were driving across Europe and then yeah. and, and everything was great, and then I I had to leave early, so I I left. Yeah, <laughs> you, you had a couple other drivers with you. Yeah, and, and I remember talking with you the next week, and it's it's a different experience. It was terrifying. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, it makes it makes a really big difference, and so being able to get that rest. So let's back up a little bit because this this story about Amy and you is is so interesting. And it's also, it's also re, I think it does carry over a lot to people that are traveling by vehicle as a couple. But, um, well, let's start off. It's a little bit of a fun story. So you were her teacher, weren't you? I was her sailing instructor. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So she, so she shows up for the, for a sailing class. Yeah, her and her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> <the class. laughs> so. uh, soon to be ex-boyfriend. Yeah. I like this. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I think it was on its way out. It had nothing to do with me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. All right. So so they show up. They show up at the at the at the class. Now, did you did you feel a connection with her that that soon in the process? I think so. Yeah. yeah. We we kind of hit it off. You know, in the first. As soon as we met. Yeah, sure. To some degree. Well, Um, and she's, and Amy just has the most like beautiful spirit about her. Yeah. Like she has this infectious smile and this joy for life and, and this optimism, this enthusiasm that really it comes across. And so, and so do you, but you know, I can see why it would, she would be easy, a quick, quick person to, to fall for. Yeah. We, we connected early on and, and we were buddies for a good year and a half. I mean, We'd go on dates with other people and then tell each other how horrible dating was. And, yeah, sure. You know, we were we were hanging out, go shoot pool, and drinking uh-huh. buddies for a good year and a half before we ever kind of realized that we should just, you know, it was right. Yeah. It was right in front of us the whole sure, time. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Well, sometimes we're. I mean, at least guys are slow learners. So. Yeah, very slow, a little slow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh well, that's and it's just such a neat. It's a neat story, and I've been able to. Since I've known you guys for, uh, we were think we were th- talking about it this morning. It's about eighteen years yeah, right that I've kn- that I've known you. Two thousand six, two thousand five, maybe. I think Back, even the expedition. It was even earlier than that because expedition trophy. Days. It was even before I started expedition portal yeah. because you you I put we were both part of the same Land Rover. It was the, like yeah, the, Air- the Arizona Land Rover Club. That's right. We were both part, of, and that was before I even started expedition portal. You know, I put out. An, an, you know, they had a chat board or an yeah, email or something, right. and and I had I've always had a very competitive nature, whether it's be with you know, kind of team sports or mm-hmm. ball sports or or sailing or or whatever it was, and and I remember having this Land Rover as a Discovery two yeah. in two thousand one, and you know we'd go out and explore, but I was kind of getting bored with that part of it. Sure, and I remember putting out this. Plus, you go on the the groups are great, but you go on these trail runs and everybody's going two miles an hour looking at every rock before yeah. they crawl over it. And I mean, it was just very, it was a, it was a long day and <laughs> sure. I was looking for something else. And so I, I actually put out to everybody like, Hey, we have these incredibly capable trucks. Are there any, is there anything competitive that we can do with them? Yeah. And, and you had responded that, Hey, by the way, I'm, I'm putting together this, it was the expedition trophy. Right. And it was the very first one, and you would drop a coordinate out in the middle of the BLM land. That was the best part of it. And the you, number of people who never made it because they like they could never find their way. And I remember get I think it was that first one. It was on Wickenburg out on the wash somewhere. <laughs> sure. And there was this huge cliff that had to be three or four hundred feet tall <laughs> yeah. that dropped down to the river. And I followed the coordinates, and I wound up at the top of the cliff. Yeah looking down at the camp. I would do that intentionally yeah. just to mess with people. And then I had to, it was like another three hours to figure <laughs> out how to get down, down to where you guys were. Yeah. So yeah, I loved those events. And that's, I think that's the first place we, well, we really met, started hanging out. That's right. For yeah. sure. We had met briefly when you bought my grandpa's welder yeah, the, before the, that. Two, the Lincoln Red Box. That's right. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man. So, so Amy and you, you get, you get together and how did that conversation go? I mean, there's got to be so many people listening that would love to like wildly change their life. How do you go from both having like basically corporate jobs to like we're going to 
sell everything or move? We're going to move on to a sailboat? Yeah. I mean, like, how did that all go I, down? So I think the easiest way to do it is is it kind of be in your early to mid-20s. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, or so, you got to be much older. Or yeah. you got to be a little bit older and well sorted out. I mean, I think about, because we're looking at doing that in the next. It's like, okay, sure. what do we do yeah. once the kids are, are kind of through college and things yes. like that? And, you know, and that's not that far away. Not that and, far. And so we're scratching our heads. And it's like, so what's the next chapter? But back then, we kind of looked at everything. And we didn't know how long it was going to take. The The original intent was to circumnavigate. Yeah. And so we kind of, you know, we got married and we said, well, what are we going to do? Do you want to, you know move out to the suburbs and buy a house and have kids and, you know, or do you want to stay in the city and buy a brownstone, which you couldn't even afford, but you know, the idea yeah, of sure. it's like, what are you going to do next? Right. And we came came up with this harebrained idea of let's sell everything that we own. And we bought a sailboat in Florida and we lived on it for two years, yeah. saving money. And then we took off for two years and probably right? kind of preparing the boat in a yeah, way. A lot yeah. of, a lot of preparation mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing and just getting ready for it. And so we were planning on doing a circumnavigation and that's still to this day, it's one of my kind of lifelong dreams is to circumnavigate for sure. And so that's what the, the intent was. And we were, we were trying to get there. Um, I think financially we were trying to save up enough and we were trying to prepare the boat yeah. for that type of an endeavor. And what was the type of boat again? It was a 1978 Allied Princess. It was a stay sail catch. So, so it had two masts. Two masts, three quarter keel. Yeah. So it was a kind of a, a very well known blue water boat. Sure. You know, made in the seventies, the hull was three inches thick. Sure. You know, I mean, it was just bounce, back when off, they, bounce off of icebergs. Yeah. It's back when they didn't really understand fiberglass. So they just like <laughs> overbuilt everything. Yeah, sure. So the, um, the intent was to circumnavigate. And after being in that environment of preparation, uh, we were living in a marina where we saw like, it was like the place that dreams went to die. Yeah. You know, every, they made the first step, but yeah, they're there and they were, everybody had their story of what they were going to do, yeah. but nobody was doing it. Yeah. Um, and so one day we just kind of woke up and we said, we're out of here. We didn't, we didn't care how much money we had. We didn't care what project there we thought we still needed to do on the boat. We basically just, you know, I think we woke up, we called our family and, and our jobs and said, you got a week and <laughs> we're out of here. And, um, <laughs> And then we just left. And I would say <clears throat> a lot of that probably correlates to, you know, a sailing adventure, any adventure, a backpacking adventure, a, a bicycling adventure, you know, really a, an overlanding adventure, anything that you're going to go do where you're going to completely step away from your day to day for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, you have to get to a certain point where you have some comfort in what you're doing. Yeah. But you're never going to be fully prepared. Yeah, that's the problem. And, and so if you can find a point where you're, where you can admit to yourself that like, okay, we're probably going to be okay if we were just going to leave, but we want to do these five other projects. Don't worry about the projects and just yeah. go. Yeah. Um, we wound up, you know, and I find that we do it with overland adventures as well. We took too much stuff with us. We did projects to the vehicle or the boat that were, in the long run, probably unnecessary. But when mm. you're sitting in a marina, they make you feel safe. Sure. They make you feel like, oh, if I do this one thing, I'm going to be able to be safer when I'm out there. Sure. You're probably never going to take it out of the box, you know. Um, well, so and it's and it's like I've I've watched. That's the only thing I watch on YouTube is sailing stuff. Yeah. And uh, one of the ones that I watched was this French guy. And he, he, it's this crazy minimalist boat. It's maybe 24 feet long. And he, it does not have an engine. He has a sculling oar that was made for him on some island, you know, like near Tahiti. Yeah. Like they made him this oar. Like he probably had one. It probably broke or whatever. And they made him one. It's, it's this beautiful oar. And he has this, this attachment on the back yeah. that, you know, you know, that he uses to scull the boat into the slip or into the sounds like fun, but that's too hardcore for me. But, the, but, the, but it just shows it yeah. totally proves your point. And we say that a lot about with overlanding, just go like whatever you've got, just start moving and then figure out what you really need. And maybe you make some adjustments or whatever. One of the, my fro you know, in that regard is 
I think the preparation is how you're going to enjoy your time Mm -hmm. when you're out doing it. Yeah. And one of the most frustrating things that I find, especially with overland vehicles. Now we, we test a lot of stuff. Sure. We play around with a lot of gear. So we, we wind up bringing a lot more than we would normally bring on our own. Sure. Um, And you and I have both experienced that where we'll go do it little adventure just for ourselves sure and we're like you you don't even you maybe bring a pair of socks a, a, a I mean, bed roll yeah. and i sleep in the back <laughs> you, of the you, defender yeah exactly. yeah you barely bring anything with you yeah. but but i've had you know those experiences where you bring all the stuff and then you you realize how much time you are spending managing the stuff yeah so instead of enjoying the environment that you went to go see to begin with mm-hmm. um so in that regard i think i'm a bit of a minimalist um but i'm also a bit of a gadget guy. I love all the gear. I love the innovation. I love to see kind of how it, in an ideal situation, like how does that piece of gear enhance the experience? Totally. And a lot of times they do. Yeah. But it, it helps to be prepared, like read the instructions and install it before you get to camp. Well, but like what an important lesson that you two learned so early in life is like, don't, don't let the dream die in the Marina. Like you chose, you chose, like you had the awareness to say, like, if we aren't careful, we're going to get more and more comfortable with the idea of not leaving. And you're probably going to get promoted and, you know, either you're going to, or you're going to think like, oh, maybe we should buy a newer boat or a bigger boat or a more comfortable boat. And, and you, you, you're right. You never actually get to go. Yeah. And Amy was a big driver in that. I think she actually, I think she actually said we need to go or we're going to we got to go do something else. Yeah, sure. Because the you know the marinas are great, and it depends on why you're there, um, but it's easy to stagnate. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was sure. she was a really good catalyst. Becomes a floating condo, and that's it. Yeah, very much so. And then your your boat gets so kind of overwhelmed with everything else that you never even go use it as a boat. Right. Exactly. Or it's like, oh my gosh, I got to disconnect that and everything yeah. else. Yeah. No, it's so funny because the last time that I went to the sailboat, I literally just said, I'm not, I'm not even going to plug anything in. I am going to get to the boat. I'm going to throw the things on there and I'm going to cast off the bow That's lines. what they're for. <laughs> so like, you know, otherwise if you get plugged in and you get the AC going and you know, you make a cocktail and then you're, and you, then you can't go sailing, right? you know, so, so it just, I just got on the boat and went. Uh, but so you guys, you guys decide you're going to leave in a week and then now the two of you are and how long had you been you how long has you had you guys been together at this point a couple of years probably i'd say like 4 years close to 4 years cuz okay. we you know we maybe a little bit longer than that um you know we were buddies for about a year and a half and yeah. then we dated for about a year and then and then we got married in 2000 and then, like, our honeymoon was driving from Chicago to Florida to move on to the boat. And so then about, you know, a year and a half, two years after that is when we, we took off. And we just went, again, that, that whole idea of circumnavigating turned into just going. Yeah. And so we went south. We went into the Caribbean. Um, and I remember being – so Marathon Key is a very common – hop off point to cross the Gulf stream. Mm. And we were uh, sitting in the bar and there was this family that was going over the map and they knew detailed day by day, every place that they were going to go do or go, every place they were going to go and everything they were going to do when they were there. Sure. And they looked at us and they said, where are you guys going to go? And we said, South, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we had no idea. Right. Um, which you, was, you knew how to sail. And that was enough. Yeah. yeah. And it was actually very, you know, it, for a, for a hot second, we felt unprepared. Yeah. But in the long run, I think it was very liberating because yeah. we didn't feel like we had this list of things to, that we had to do. Yeah. Um, and so there were, we missed a couple of things in hindsight, but we, it was a spectacular time to yeah. just kind of go wander. Yeah. Um, and so then about, you know, about two years down there and then we kind of, it was that it was time for the next chapter. So we wanted to start a family and that's what brought us back to the States. And how long did you, did you two sail in the Caribbean? Right around two years. Amazing. Yeah. And I, one of the things that I remember Amy and you talking about that stuck with me was that there were, and correct me if I get the numbers wrong, 
because I've probably inflated the coolness of this situation, but it was very cool. <laughs> so you guys were being super frugal. Yeah. And there were there was a series of months in a row that you two spent less than $120 a month total in expenses. Other than I think you had some insurance on the boat or there was something else we, we beyond a, that. Yeah, we had a couple of, I'd call them like background expenses. Yeah. So, you know. Storage units or whatever. Yeah, right? insurance. And I think we were still carrying a car insurance. Yeah. So we had boat insurance, things like that. Yeah. Right? The things that you just kind of, it's really hard to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, and then, and the boat insurance was required for what we were doing. And so aside from that, um, I think as far as just like operational costs, which yeah. might be, you know, fuel and food and whatever luxuries we decided to partake in. A couple beers, yeah. Yeah, I think the the least expensive one was, um, the least expensive month was right around $150. I mean, and that's you incredible. Know. And I remember you would, you, the story went on and you'd wake up in the morning and you'd say, hey, Amy, what do you want to have for dinner? And she'd be like, I want lobster. And you'd go, you would just I'd go, go di- lobster. you go dive yeah. into the ocean, like this, this bounty of nature. Yeah. And you guys would catch your protein and you had rice and beans on board. Yeah, it was and, an island life, 100%. And it just didn't matter. It just didn't matter. But you think about the people who they toil their entire life, 70 years to have this pool of money that like they could have stopped 20 years earlier. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I'm not suggesting that that's right for everyone and, and people have families and it's not at all a criticism. It's just, it, it is a choice. Like we're not really stuck oftentimes. I think it's a change in, in lifestyle. Yeah. Right. So we're all very used to a, a certain lifestyle, whether it's, whether it's a luxurious lifestyle or whether it's just the expense of the, of kind of, the requirements, right? Sure. If you've got, if you've got kids, if you've got kids in college, if you've got, you know, whatever payments that are just kind of part of whatever you've gotten yourself into, right? Sure. And, and so it's, and then you get used to it, right? So then it's hard to completely, completely minimize uh, unless it's something that you truly want to be doing. Right. Right. Um, but we, we didn't have that much money when we left. Yeah. I mean, maybe like 10 grand. Sure. You know, and for something like that, it's, that's nothing. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, we, we just kind of figured it out along the way. Sure. And it's, it, it's in hindsight, it's totally different than now. I mean, we didn't have, we had a pocket mail, which a pocket mail is like how you would do email. Right. And it was this little tiny, it was like a big Blackberry with a fold out thing that went up, <laughs> up against the payphone. And you know that sound that the fax machine makes? <laughs> yeah. That's what would happen. That's how you sent an email. Oh, my gosh. So, so you'd, you'd have a pay phone in... in yeah, we it, spent more money on phone cards than, yeah. than anything else. I mean, it was... This this thing had... It would flip open. It had a thumb keyboard on it. You'd write an email. You'd close it. You'd pop out the little phone connector. And you'd hold them up to each other. And they would do the fax machine garbles back and forth and then that's how you sent an email and so now looking at it with something like starlink we'd probably still be out there yeah you know yeah because you could work you you could work from the road sure you can work from wherever you're at and so you know i think that going back to like how you would just go and do it it's you know you kind of find that reduction in needs yeah and then but you're doing it for the for the right reasons you're doing because you want to be doing it. So you find that reduction in needs and then you kind of shift the perspective and then you, and you go do it. And if that's not what you want, it might not work. Yeah. Was that one of the happiest times of your life? Yeah, probably, probably. I mean, it's 20 years and I still talk about it or 30 years. And I, yeah. And I think cause, cause Matt Scott talks about a similar thing when Laura and him drove around Australia and it was like they had the low least amount of money they've ever had in their life. And he had never been happier. Yeah. So it's just, like, it was, boy, it's a, it's just a, such a tough lesson to learn. It is, you know, but I mean. And you guys know that now. And we do, and we'll figure out how to get back to it. Yeah. You know, but right well, now it's. You're, well, that's, but that's another thing that I, I so respect about you, Brian, is that when Amy and you decided to have children and like very soon after you had both kids. I mean, you guys were a regular part of my life. So I've seen your kids grow up Mm. and I've seen the quality of parents that Amy and you are. And I have never once seen 
you guys make a decision that wasn't fully vested in the success of your children and the happiness and the safety and the care of your kids. Um, and that is a huge sacrifice. Like you've literally said, this is now the most important thing in my life. And the idea of going sailing or living on 120 bucks a month, that doesn't, it doesn't fit right. with what is now the most important thing in your life. Yeah. Well, they're, and they're great kids and we have, they're I, amazing. I feel kids. very fortunate that we have a, I, I think we have an amazing family, yeah. you know, and, and so that helps, Yeah, you know, there's a lot that is the new priority. And so with, you know, and things are going great. Both kids are successful and, you know, they're my, amazing. My daughter just went into college and my you know son's a junior in high school and they're both, you know, four what point. is he at? Six, six foot four, 220 <laughs> pounds senior no, yeah, junior. I don't a even little, know. A little bit different. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's a junior. He's, so he's 16 years old. He's uh <laughs> What he's about six foot four. <laughs> yeah, I think he's right at six foot four and he's about 180 pounds. That's crazy. Um, and so he's, you know, he's succeeding at everything he does. Yeah, he's uh, crushing it. You know, 4.0 kid and uh, mountain biking and everything else. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's wicked fast on a mountain bike. Um, and then, you know, our daughter Charlie, she just went into her freshman year of, of college. She got a partial scholarship. She's 4.0. I mean, every. Everything is just kind of going really well. Um, but that's because both, Amy and you made that a priority. Well, they do a lot of hard work on their own. Yeah. I mean, we kind of, we've always kind of said, well, let's, let's do whatever we can to facilitate the opportunity, make the opportunity available. Sure. And, and if they want to take it and run with it, they can. Yeah. Um, and that's what they've chosen to do. Yeah. So. They're both super driven. Yeah. So let's, let's move on a little bit now. So there was uh, this fateful day, I think it was sometime in 2006, and I, ca- I call you up and I said, hey, Brian, you want to you wanna go meet for lunch in, in Phoenix? I want to talk to you about an idea. <laughs> we went to the sushi broker. <laughs> we did. Yeah. That's right. In North Scottsdale, I think, <clears throat> something like that. And, uh, and we met up for lunch, and we talked about this crazy idea called Overland Journal. I remember that. Yeah. It was you and, uh, and Chris Marzoni. That's right. That's right. And we were trying to figure out who we were going to bring on in the business development role because I knew that was so important. I mean, it was something that I learned really early on in business is to, is to never underestimate the importance of, of really talented business development people and then to pay them the most that you can possibly afford. And, you know, because they're such a critical piece of an organization. So I knew that that role was going to be the most critical role that we had with a new fledgling business. And you were employee number one. Yeah. So you're still right. number one, Brian, in Thanks, my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, we started off with his sushi restaurant and, and you were like, you were in it from like the first second. You're like, yeah, man, let's go. And yeah. And I was right. I think at the time and you know, I was ready to do like my own thing. Sure. And you know, what a, what a great opportunity with kind of a very, again, with a vetted team of people. Yeah. Um, and everybody brought their own strengths to the idea. Sure. You know, I, th- I know that we had, <clears throat> we had you guys, we had Jonathan Hansen, who was like the editor in chief. Yeah. And, and one of the world-class editor. Yeah. Really well known on the journalism side. And, and then, yeah, I think we just brought everybody together in it. It, it took a couple of years, it but it did. worked out. It did. It did. Yeah, it was mostly terrifying <laughs> in the beginning, but uh, we we kept working our way through it. And you were still working uh, full time uh, for the first couple of years, but but then you, at some point in time, you decided it was time to come to Prescott. And I think what what, what year did you guys move up here? We twenty eleven. We maybe? moved up here in twenty eleven. Yeah. But I think I went. I probably went full time all in years. on it around 2009. Yeah, so we I had think started, so. I think that original conversation was 2006. Yep. Published the first issue spring 2007. Mm. In 2007, 2008, I was working for a um, for a full service marketing firm ad agency down in Phoenix. Yeah. And I mean in every in in every definition of the term, I was moonlighting Overland Journal. We yeah. all we all were, I think, yeah, at the time. For sure, and, yeah. And the the agency that I worked for was um, really pigeonholed into high end real estate development, and that's what we were doing. And 
so 2008 came along. Oh yeah, that was a bad time. <laughs> bad time for real yeah. estate. And, but we were kind of at the high end of the spectrum, right? So we were doing these big private real estate developments from, sure. like from scratch. And so it took about a year for all that to catch up to the development side. Sure. Right. So by 2009, all of a sudden that world, you know, went, went downhill pretty quick. And so that became an opportunity for me to say, okay, am I going to go to another company and get, you know, another desk in a corner office type deal? Yeah. Or am I going to kind of do this overland thing full time? Get out of the marina. hundred percent. Right. Yeah. And again, the catalyst in my life, Amy was like, just do it. Yeah. So, so that's when, you know, I went full time into the overland journal and expedition portal and just, you know, pushed as hard as I could on that. And then the next kind of the next evolution was in 2011. Amy was graduating from her master's degree. Yeah. And as part of her master's degree, she had, um, she had to stop working and do this like three or six month internship. So she did that. And then after she was done with the internship and it was really this as part of her master's degree, it was a, you know, an an experiential, um, practice of an internship. And so that after that, she had this opportunity of, you know, does she go back to the job that she had before or she kind of had a, a clean slate? Sure. So that's when we decided we were living in, in Phoenix, which neither one of us really enjoyed Phoenix. Sure. So we, that's when it's we It's an moved, acquired taste for sure. <laughs> it's not how people do it. But that's when we moved up to Prescott. And, and then I, th- I think that it was really good for all of us. I yeah. think that was kind of another shot in the arm. It seemed like it. Because we were all in the office every day or, or immediately accessible to No, the another. business really grew at that yeah. point because then we had, we had the whole kind of dream team all firing on all cylinders. Yeah, we did. So. Yeah, so then well, you've done some really interesting trips since, since you started working with us. So, I mean, I think back on one of the first – real big ones that we did together was uh, driving up to Tuk Tuk. Oh, that's right. With, uh, with the guys from AEV. That's right. And before that, you had helped me with Expedition 7. We moved some trucks throughout Europe, and that was really cool, too. That but, was cool. You know, it was definitely a mission. It was a delivery. Uh, yeah, it was, it was like a, vehicle a delivery, delivery. <laughs> vehicle delivery <laughs> we mission. Did nine countries in five days. That's right. We drove from, we drove from, uh, from Prague to... Patrice's place in France. That's right. In the yeah. south of France. That's right. Exactly. And then we went all the way up to Estonia? Yes. So then we had to drive them. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. That, n- did you drive them to, with, to, to Estonia? Yeah, all that's the way right. to the border. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. You helped me get them all the way up to Estonia because we were about to cross Russia. That's right. Like the next day that we met that Russian fixer. That's right. And Andre. Yeah. Andre. <laughs> And then that's where we kind of did the handoff. That's right. So that I, was, Andre flew in. I handed the keys to him, and he, and then I flew out. That's right. And then the rest of the team came in. Yeah, that was. I mean, imagine like today that'd be impossible. Like you can't. You wouldn't even think about trying to cross Russia right now. Oh yeah. You know, it's just like it's amazing how these windows of opportunity open and then close. Yeah. So, so like one, the people once in a lifetime. For totally. Sure. Yeah. I hope. I mean, I hopefully hope it, it changes. Hopefully it changes. Yeah. That you can be. I'm, rational it optimist will, yeah point. it does it always ends up coming around so so we did that and then we did this big trick up trip up to to tuck and that was your first experience in the the high latitudes overlanding and mm-hmm. what what did you take away from that experience uh, being in such cold environments um, but also in a very different kind of vehicle than you'd ever traveled in yeah that trip i think that was a very secure trip i thought yeah. In the sense that, you know, one, nothing went wrong. Yeah. The um, vehicles were flawless. And I never felt like anything was going to go wrong. I mean, we yeah. were driving through whiteouts. Yeah. We had that one stretch of the road. It was the Dalton? Yeah, it was, it was the, the Dempster Highway. The Dempster Highway. Yeah. So there was that one stretch of the Dempster where we had just made it through before yeah. they closed the gate. Yeah. And then when we showed up on the other end, they thought that the, the road was clear. They didn't <laughs> yeah. expect anybody to be out there. That's right. It, it was, was, to- it was total, total whiteout. Yeah, total whiteout. And I think that whole time, I mean, we were getting out of the cars. We were taking photos in the whiteout. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
like I never felt, and maybe it's just I, those type of extreme environments, I, I'm very comfortable with them. Yeah. Um, and also they're, they're one of those things like you can't really think about what might go wrong because the problem is, is like everything is fine mm-hmm. until it's really not fine. Yeah. It, it's gotta go really wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've exactly. got, we had four, you know, completely built out AEV trucks. Right. We were fully supplied. Right. We had, I think there were six of us. Yeah. And we had a snow machine. We did. I mean, we had all the things that, you know, the worst thing that could happen is maybe you're, you sit there overnight because everything broke. But right. It, it just wasn't, you know. The, uh, there was only two times that I felt for my life was, um, or was, or I was concerned about people's safety was, you know, Dave decided to just start like driving out on the Arctic Ocean. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> I do remember. Out on the frozen sea ice. Yeah. He just like, we, we were already on the frozen sea ice, but yeah. this was sea ice that had at least been like prepared for vehicle travel. Right. And then he just like drives over this mound of snow and just starts driving out onto the ocean, yeah, the frozen in that ocean. 3,500 flatbed, yeah, right? In that flatbed yeah. white AEV truck. <laughs> and I'm just, and it was, these are amazing photographs. I mean, don't get me wrong. The yeah. thing, the whole thing was so cool, but it's like he's getting further and further away. He was and, way out there. Yeah. And there's, there are polar bear and there are absolute, you could see like the, like the, the oil drilling rigs and stuff. Like he was driving out into the ocean. That wasn't planned. Like that was the <laughs> only thing that was like, he's kind of doing his own thing. <laughs> Which was, and so I got some of the most memorable photographs from that moment. And then the other one was, there was this grizzly bear and I it just, I don't know what I was thinking, but I wanted to get like, it's like the reason why people get punted by, by bison in Yosemite. Yeah. But like, I'm like, look at this beautiful, it's a YouTube bear, video. look at this bear. So I, I just, I stepped out of the vehicle. I don't know what I was thinking. And I'm taking photos of this bear. And I realized like the bear is actually, it looks like he's looking forward, but he's not, he's looking right at me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I better get back in the truck, get back in the truck. Yeah, but that that was a really fun trip, though. I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah. It was just gorgeous environments, and that was a fun one. And then a few years later, we had the chance to do the Altar Desert with Yeah, AV two again. polar extremes, right? Yeah, so, that's I mean, right. You've got the Arctic and then, you know, the desert, 120-degree desert. So. Yeah, it was very hot. And, and so in – in all of your overland travels, which you've done so much with your family too, what do you what do you think is the is the top two, three, four takeaways? The things that you've really learned in your now decades of overland travel? Yeah, I would say, you know, preparation is is key. I think, but not over preparing to the point that you've kind of neutered it. Yeah, or you that know. you never leave the marina. Yeah. Well, and not not just that, but it, it's so easy to, to do to be so prepared that you take the adventure out of the adventure, mm. right? So, I mean, if you think about it, we can get on Google Earth and we can follow every dirt road and see everything that we would likely encounter. Right. Um, I actually got to the point with with navigation planning that I'll have a general idea of where I'm going, and I'll have maybe some if there's key roads and key tracks that like I have to get in order to do, to get where I'm going, like those are critical elements. Like that's the only way to get there. Sure. I'll make note of that. Otherwise I tend to just go in the general direction. Sure. Um, because I, I, I really get a lot out of, well, that road looks like it'll go to where we want. Let's try it. You know? And if you, I think if you over plan that to, too much degree you actually take a lot of that experience away that serendipity yeah Yeah. um the other thing would probably be less is more um which is a tough one because again all these all these amazing products and gadgets out on the market that it really some of them do enhance the experience and so it's hard to pick and choose maybe being selective yeah um but you know, I, I, well, and you were forced into that. You did a lot of your travels for years, as I remember, in a two door TJ. Yeah, we did. Like you, 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 you had, you were forced to be minimalist. You had four people, like two grown adults. So that's that trip. So we did a trip from Arizona to the Canadian border, as much dirt as we could get, and and we tried to hit as many national parks as we could at the same time, right? And this right. was like the family. Summer trip. <laughs> totally. right? it, was a, it was a 30 day trip. That was the right? McVickers vacation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, 
And I remember, I don't know why, I probably do know why, but I remember asking like you and a couple other people, I was like, hey, I've got the, you know, like I've got, which three, which of the three vehicles should we take? <laughs> and everybody like pointed towards the most practical one and I took the most <laughs> impractical <laughs> one. I took the, t- the two-door TJ yeah. because I knew it was going to add that much more to the adventure. Yeah, right? sure. Right. And we overloaded the heck out of that thing. I remember pulling into Jackson Hole, Wyoming, getting to camp, and looking, I did a walk around in the truck, and all of a sudden I find, I think I sheared off three wheel studs <laughs> on a on a rear on a rear wheel on uh, a rear passenger yeah. wheel. I lost three wheel studs because we were so overloaded. Yep. I don't know how we didn't die or <laughs> or crash or what, but and then I went I went back into town. I left the family at camp, and I went back into town. I found a hardware store i found the appropriate like grade eight bolts because they weren't the press in they were it was like yukon oh sure it was a yukon axle sure hub assembly and um so they were actually threaded bolts they weren't just like pressed in wheel studs interesting and it might have been why they broke it could have been because <laughs> like they yeah wheel studs are very specific yeah. metallurgy to them yeah so I, I i got these grade eight bolts from some hardware store and i sat under a shady tree and i changed those wheel studs out myself like on the side of the road amazing and um it took forever but i figured it out and i think that that's that trip added a lot to the planning and preparation where that I think where that fine line of of over over preparing or being underprepared or being overloaded and still having an adventure. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember it's um somewhere in I think it's southern Utah, but there's a there are these three mountains. There's like Crystal Mountain and then there's like the Moon Mountain and the Sun Mountain. Okay. Right? And there's so it an, sounds like Sedona Vortex to it, me. It, it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's way out there. And uh, Literally. There, there's, this, there's a national park. I, I don't remember any of the names right now. But there's a national park, and then just north of that, you take this, this dirt track that I remember Amy and I looking at each other and then looking in the backseat at the kids and then kind of questioning whether or not this was a good idea. <laughs> and, and we just still went and did it, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I, we were incredibly remote yeah. in this vehicle, this little TJ, family of four, all to ourselves, and that's it. So this is the 1120, it's 1120 a.m. This is the national emergency broadcast system. <laughs> it's going off on it's, every device. It's going off on every device in Arizona. It is not going off on my light phone because my light phone, oh. it is, yeah, I call it's it a the potato. potato. I call it the potato. It. <laughs> It kind of texts and it kind of does phone calls. Yeah, they they, they talked about this on uh, NPR this morning. There's no way to opt out of it. Oh, it's got being it. delivered to every device. Got it. In, well, it looks in like Arizona, it, just, it looks like it just did it. So that's all it took. So, <laughs> that's so funny. Now you know exactly when we were recording that's this right. podcast. It's a moment in history. So the other thing that I I really wanted to talk about and ask you about on this podcast because it's again it's just been such a, a joy to watch Amy and you travel together and remain so close and it's I'm not implying at all that you guys don't ever have challenges but it's 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 a beautiful relationship to see and it's so rare to see people stay together and to to still be as in love with each other as you guys are I mean I just like when you guys get to giggling. You know, and it's just really awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> like it's it's literally like two school kids, you know, yeah. like sometimes when you guys get go, get going. But it's like that is so rare to find. Um, and and I know that there are people that are listening that wish they could be closer with their spouse or that they could travel better with their spouse or they would like to travel with their spouse or with in a new relationship. What advice would you give around relationships and traveling in remote areas around the world with your spouse? Yeah. Well, geez, that's like the million dollar question, right? Yeah. Um, that's why I asked it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, for us, it, it, it comes pretty naturally. I don't know if I've ever analyzed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I probably think about it more when we travel with other people mm. who like, for whatever reason, it's just not working for them. Right. Right. And you know, for us, it's, I don't know if it's communication. I think it's more of an, 
one, there's there's trusting, like I said earlier, you've got trust in your travel partner. Sure. Um, and so, I mean, she can do a, she can sail a boat by herself. She can do a, you know, a vehicle winch recovery by herself. She yep. can do all that stuff, right? So that's one less thing for the, for us to worry about the other person about, mm-hmm. it, right? Or had to have a conflict, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, she's she's got a lot of training and she's got a lot of competency, and 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 so you've got that that nice understanding there. And then it's it's also you kind of figure out like you know what's important to each other. Mm. Um, and you know, I, you just kind of know when you're traveling what that other person is going to want to experience. Sure. And, and if you don't, then you ask, Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, we've had plenty of, you're talking about all the great things, but we've had plenty of long days on the road where, you know, sure. you, you both get a little quippy and, sure. and it's, everybody's ready. And so we've actually learned like, like we'll look at each other and be like, Hey, I think it's time for a cup of coffee and something to eat, (laughs) you know? And, and so over time that just gets better because you learn the other person. Right. Um, and she'll know the things, you know, I, I, as relaxed and flexible as I can be, like I will get to a point where I get really like particular about how the back of the truck is loaded and how things are lashed down and, you know, and so she'll know. She'd be like, Hey, you know, we brought all the stuff out to the car and we're going to let you put it in. The car. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah you, know. you guys have, you guys have learned each other. And it's also, I think it, it probably also helps that it seems like that the harder it gets and the more adventurous it gets, the more Amy is happy that it's happening. Yeah. Like we, she just loves to be in it. We both thrive off of those situations that we know a lot of other people would be uncomfortable in. Sure. Right. Um, and I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah. You know, when you trust the person that you're with and you know that they're also <laughs> like in it for the adventure, no matter what yeah. you're coming up against, that's, that's pretty empowering. I would think for a couple. Yeah. And I think, you know, as far as you you ask keys or advice or something like that, and not that I'm in a position to like dictate anything, but I think the more you're able to understand whether it's with your spouse or another travel partner or with your buddy, whatever it is, for everybody to understand what the what the objective is. Mm. And that objective might just be like, we're gonna go drive and we don't care where we end up. Mm. That objective might be like, there's a specific point on the map that we're trying to get to. Um, the objective might be, hey, we wanna, we wanna go drive in the deep sand. Yeah. You know, whatever it might be, like if, if everybody kind of has an idea of what is important to the other people involved and then what the, their preferences are. Sure. And then to some degree, like what makes them very uncomfortable and what makes them, you know, very joyous. Yeah. Right. And then you can avoid those discomforts, you know, or, you know, throw them in on purposefully in an opportune time. Yeah. You know, you can, you can kind of help manage the situation. Um, and that goes both ways, right? Yeah. That's for everybody involved is trying to help the others kind of have the best experience that they can. No, I've seen so. that. And you do that not only with Amy, but you do that with your kids. And, and it seems like that they do that for you too. But like, what a joy to have had decades of that kind of partnership with your wife. And then now coming up on decades of travel with your kids and to see that they're into it, that yeah. they enjoy the adventure of it. Well, they do that. That's been an interesting path because there was a time that none of the kids didn't want to get in the car. Yeah. They didn't want to go, you know, it, we joke with Max because something happened in his childhood. And we don't know when <laughs> and where, but something we did, I'm sure, is if you say, hey, Max, you want to go on a hike? He's absolutely against it. He doesn't want to go on a hike. But So we've had to say, hey, do you want to go on an adventure walk? And he's like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> we don't understand. Uh, and so it was he's one of those hiking things. PTSD. Yeah, yeah, some hike. He didn't get to be the group leader or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and then Amy really doesn't enjoy the cold. Yeah. Right. And so I know if we're going to go do something in the in cold, then we just make sure that she's got an extra layer, an sure. extra set of gloves. You know, got she, all the good gear. All the good gear. She doesn't like the cold, but she loves to ski. Yeah. So. Sure. 
you know, you figure that you figure out how to do it. Yeah. Thank know? goodness for modern, modern <laughs> equipment. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Brian, I- any advice that you would give, you know, people coming new into overlanding or even a new, a new, a person who wants to start a new business in overlanding, what, what are some pieces of advice that you give from all of these years of experience that you have? Yeah, I'd, I'd say if you're, you know, getting into overlanding, um, use what you've got and just go do it. Um, you know, that there, there's no real right or wrong way to do overlanding. Um, I mean, overlanding is essentially, it's vehicle supported adventure. Yeah. So we can't tell you what that adventure part means. Yeah. Right. And if that means that you're going to go, you know, down the forest track and go bird watching, well, that's, that's fair. Yep. Right. Um, and if that means, Hey, I'm going to drive to the most remote point on the earth that I can access. Sure. That's fair too. Sure. Right. And then you've got everything in between. So I think it's really easy for people to get intimidated by yeah. either overlanding or any new sport or activity that they're going to get involved in. Sure. And if you can kind of lower those barriers of there's no absolute right or wrong way to do it. Yeah. And the easiest way to do it is to use what you've got, use the vehicle you already have, use the, the equipment that you already have and, and go do it, go do whatever your version of it is. Yeah. And then from there, if you want to evolve into the activity, you can start to identify, you know, what was easy, what was hard, where do I think I need improvement, whether it's through your own training as a driver or as, you know, whatever it is, if you need more medical training, if you need more, um, I mean, you can get trained on anything. Sure. Right. So if you need more training or if you need different type of equipment, right. I mean, you'll figure that out as you go. Yeah. You figure it out. I'm saying just go with what you've got, but if all you've got is a sweater and you go into a monsoon environment, (laughs) well, you're going to figure that out, but don't (laughs) prevent it from letting you go. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's great. That's great advice, Brian. And then from the business standpoint, I think, you know, nowadays there's so many things out there in the marketplace and there's so many different versions of them. You know, my advice would be to, you know, do your homework, study the environment a bit, the business environment and the, and kind of the consumer environment and try to find a hole that hasn't been addressed yet. Find a need that hasn't been addressed yet. Um, We've got plenty of, the same thing with a different colorway or a different yeah. logo on it. It all right? comes in on the same container. Yeah, from China. It's all coming yeah. from the same yeah. place. I mean, we've got plenty of that, but if you can find a way to fill a need yeah. and provide a solution, your, your path to success is going to be much faster. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, like even like that, uh, unique componentry modification to the Starlink, you know, he, he's made himself a tidy little business yeah. providing a need that like it was a genuine need, not a lot of customers, but when people get, I mean, I'm a customer and yeah. I could not be more thrilled. He, he literally created something that didn't exist. And now I've solved a problem that I had as an overland traveler. Right. And it's this perfect little business that he runs out of big bear, California. And so it, it's, it probably feels a bit niche, but I, I, or niche. Um, but I think that there's more people that could use that product than, than know about it. No question. Right. So yeah, no the question. more people that know about it, the more, yeah. the more that's going to take yeah, off. Yeah. And he focused on making something great. And, yeah. and I, I love that it quote, it's actually a Steve Martin quote, but it, it's be so good that they can't ignore you. There you go. So if you start off with making great products that re, like you said, really meets the needs of a customer people will not be able to ignore you. They're going to talk about you. And, uh, and then there's lots of other ways to amplify that message. But Brian, man, it's been such a joy to have you in my life for these last multiple decades, you and you and Amy both and your kids. Um, it's been not only the adventure of seeing the world many times together, but it's also been the adventure of building a business that we are proud of. Um, and that serves our community, um, we're an employee-owned business. You're one of our partners. You're one of the owners of the business. Um, and I'm so grateful that we got to get to this point after that that sushi lunch many, many, many years ago. Um, but we thank you all for listening. And remember that it's so important to cast off those bow lines and to leave the marina and go out on your own adventure. Thanks, Brian. You bet. Take care. All right. Thank you.